Hey everybody, I am back with another video for our Patreon uh, patrons. Very excited to get the chance to talk to you again uh, and give you some added value for uh, the subscribers, the supporters of White Rocket and for my efforts to produce uh, good quality entertainment for you. I'm doing my best. Uh, I was gone out of town all this weekend for a funeral, a family funeral. But I'm back now and I'm on spring break, so hopefully I'll be able to knock out two or three, hopefully this week, good videos. Uh, maybe a couple for just for you members and maybe one more kind of to go out there to the public to kind of recruit more folks in here to join us here in the private little cave that is our personal theater for members of the, of the Patreon account to support White Rocket. Uh, I've got to absolutely up front uh, make sure I thank all of our patrons we have so far. Um, we've, of course, got David Medinas, who was the first one on board, Mark Squire, Dave Powell, Michael Kirshner, and Bill Matthews. You guys, I really, really appreciate it. And then we have our Eagle Has Landed patron, who, who gets my undying thanks, just like the rest of you do, but especially for how much he's helping out, uh, Nicholas Cottrell. So all of you guys, so far, guys, um, we'll maybe we'll get some ladies to join in our little club soon too, but um, I hear the Babylon 5 music cranking, you know what the subject is today. But anyway, but, but you have my undying thanks, and I, I'm going to continue to try giving you not just the usual material that we put out, the various podcasts, the books, the comics, and all that, but this, this video is sort of the added value extra that I'm able to provide to you. I think I'm going to turn Babylon 5 music down just a bit there. Okay. It's hard to tell how loud it is in my earphones versus how loud it is uh, for you on the video. But yeah, Christopher Frankie's music means we're going to talk about Babylon 5 today. It's on my mind right now because I'm re-watching the entire series from scratch alongside Jared Albrick. And... Uh, we put the first episode of the podcast up a few days ago where you can hear, it's an audio only show, where you can hear Jared encountering Babylon 5 for the first time and me being an old fan, of course, um, uh, me, uh, you can see I'm modeling my jacket, thought I'd wear this, it's kind of cold down in the basement today, we got a lot of snow outside, so I thought I'd wear my snug little crew jacket with the ranger patch and the and the army of light patch today so kind of snug down here in the basement in the studio in the palatial white rocket studios we're going to talk a little bit about babylon 5 and this is a topic today that i've been wanting to get to this is a kind of a spoilerific show so if you haven't watched babylon 5 but you want to watch it you probably want to bail out now and save this until after you've watched it okay um if you are watching, if you're listening to the podcasts about Babylon 5 that we're doing, like I said, we put the first one up last week. It's in the White Rocket Entertainment feed, so just go to where you normally get White Rocket podcasts, and it'll be there. It's just a regular White Rocket podcast episode. Um, but if if you are unfamiliar with the show and you don't want to be spoiled, this is your big spoiler warning because I'm going to be talking about all five years, and my particular topic today is how different things could have been and would have been uh, without the cast changes. Because right, we all know that Joe Straczynski built in what he called trap doors for his various actors. Um, whether the, the network wanted changes that he had to abide by, or whether people left the show of their own accord, or whatever, or died, or whatever, he, you know, doing a five-year-long show, he had to be prepared to make changes on the fly. And some of those changes that he made were not necessarily changes that he originally wanted to or planned to make. So what I want to do is kind of walk through what Babylon 5 would have been like if things had never changed and how different the story would have been and maybe connect a few dots that ended up getting... Uh, having to be redirected and, you know, rerouted, as they would say on Star Trek or Babylon 5 or something. So... I don't want this going forever, so let's let's uh, get right on to it. Now, remember, this is pure speculation on my part. All I have to go by is just what I observed watching the show uh, for all those years, several times through, reading the novels, following it on the internet, all the various things, right? But I'm sure I'm going to leave out plenty. This is just what came to me off the top of my head as I started following those rabbits down the rabbit holes of where they might have gone 
without the cast changes. So, uh, I'm sure that maybe out there on the internet there are websites where they've speculated and laid out entirely different alternate histories. In fact, let me tell you about one. There is a gigantic thing out there on the internet called the Dark Distorted Universe. Babylon 5 Dark Distorted Mirror. And what it is, a, a British young guy several years ago, about 10 or 15 years ago now, um, he, he actually wrote the equivalent of like five giant novels doing all five seasons if one tiny thing had happened differently at the beginning of the series. I won't tell you anything more than that, but I mean, it's like War and Peace is like the size of the prologue to this thing. It's huge. If you decide, and it's incredibly well done, and there are characters that barely ever get mentioned on the show maybe one time that become major characters in this, and there are major characters that end up very minor in this. So it's worth totally checking out. It's called Dark Distorted Mirror, Babylon 5, but it'll take you quite a long time to read through it, but it's very good. Okay, so here is my speculation. I haven't ever gone and read any of those other things like guessing. This is just purely me. Now, here's kind of how I would start out. I think the number one thing you have to change to see how Babylon 5 would have gone would be that Sinclair remains the commander. Okay, almost everything else comes out from Sinclair leaving the show. By the way, if you may have noticed, I've redone my microphone. I may have to put it back because it's kind of in the way here. It's kind of bothering me. But almost everything uh, that changed came from Sinclair being replaced uh, by Bruce Boxleitner, by John Sheridan at the beginning of season two. Now, the in-story reason is that Sinclair goes to become the ambassador to Minbar. Now, the, the interesting thing about it is that Sheridan was seen by almost everybody as being like a, as he put it, a jarhead, a, a rough, tough military guy that everybody would have thought would have done the bidding of President Clark, right? So when Sheridan turns out to be, um, you know, much more of an intelligent person, somebody willing to... Uh, stand up for his beliefs against the government and all that, that was a surprise, and I have to think it was a surprise to the Minbari. So my first question is, if the Minbari were so determined to have Sinclair be the commander, um, why would they agree suddenly to have him go and be the ambassador on Minbar and have a guy they didn't approve of suddenly be uh, the commander of Babylon 5. And I wonder where Sheridan would have been on that alleged list from the beginning of the first season, or really from the pilot, right? Because when Sheridan first, I mean, when Sinclair was first chosen to be the commander, uh, the word was he was way down on the list, and the Minbari vetoed everybody above him until the Minbar, until the Earth finally said, well, how about this pilot? And they're like, yes, we like him. And Earth is like, seriously, you like him? Oh, yes, he's the one we want. Well, so... You would have thought they would have vetoed Star Killer John Sheridan, but they didn't. So maybe they knew more about him than even uh, Earth did. And that's a very interesting uh, idea to pursue. But anyway, all right. So if we keep Sinclair on, that means we also keep Catherine Sakai. And that's very interesting because I think we know what's what would have become of Catherine Sakai. I always thought it was a it was very unfortunate for poor Julia Nixon that she had a neat role that would have gone multiple seasons probably on Babylon 5, but she kind of lost her job on there because Michael O'Hare, uh, Sinclair, left the show. So she was kind of a collateral damage of them getting rid of, of uh, Sinclair. Um, now, we know that JMS made a very good point, which is that in the end, it probably made more logical sense to have two characters, a Sheridan and a Sinclair, because Sinclair gets to be just the guy with the connections to the Minbar, to the Minbari, right, and Valen and all that, and which is kind of separate from Sheridan being the guy with the connection to the Shadows and the Shadow War. 
So it, in some ways, it makes sense to separate those two things out into two different characters. It's a little, it's asking a bit much for Sinclair to have been the nexus of all of that, all of that. Okay. Um, so if Sinclair had continued, he would have been the the Mimbari connection and the Shadow connection and the nexus of almost everything. Um, so what that would have meant is that Catherine Sakai, who in the first season we see going off on different missions like to Sigma 957, where Jakar tells her, don't go, don't, and then goes and has her rescued, right? Because the walkers are, walkers sound, <laughs> are there. Um, so we know she goes off on surveys to strange and scary distant planets. And I think we know which strange and scary distant planet Catherine probably would have ended up with. And that would be, of course, Zahadoom. So what that means is that Catherine the Surveyor would have gone to Zahadoom first, probably with, um, well, that would have meant that she wasn't on the ship with Mr. Morden, right? Morden's already gone to Zahadoom and come back. Catherine would have to go there later because, you know, we've seen Mr. Morden in season one while Catherine is still Catherine. Okay, so that's an interesting... They'd have had to have a different way. I believe in the book that ended up coming out, uh, they try to say that um, Anna Sheridan and Morden were on the same ship and both got captured by the shadows together. So that... That could not have been the case with uh, Catherine. Okay. Um, that means, of course, that when the shadows send Anna Sheridan back to the station at the in that fantastic finale of season three, that means that it would have been Catherine Sakai after the wedding, right? Catherine Sakai would have said to Delenn, "I'm Catherine." J uh, Jeff's wife s drops the snow globe, Delenn, right? Um, so that means that Sinclair would have married Catherine at the beginning of season two. Catherine would have gone off to Zaha Doom on her little ship. And then Jeff would have gotten word that Catherine was dead somewhere out on the rim and not coming back. And he would have been crushed and heartbroken through the rest of season two, and then in season three would be where Jeff and Delenn start getting together, start falling in love, and of course then uh, Catherine would come back and drop the bombshell that she's still alive, and what, how dare you, you Minbari person with hair, <laughs> how dare you get with my guy, right? Okay. That would have been an interesting turn of events instead. And by the way, I have no idea if everybody watching this who's a Babylon 5 fan, you guys may have figured all this out immediately. I may not be telling you anything you don't already know or haven't already figured out. I, you know, that may very well be the case. Uh, hopefully, though, watching me kind of work my way through it is at least somewhat entertaining to you, okay? And maybe I'll think of a few things you haven't thought of, and I probably will miss a few things that you have thought of. Um, Let's see. So here's an interesting thing. If Delenn, and, if Delenn and Sinclair get together instead of Delenn and Sheridan, then that would make more sense in a way because Sinclair, of course, becomes Valen and goes back in time. And so if, 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 uh, if Jeff and Delenn have a child instead of Sheridan and Delenn having a child, right? In other words, if David is, is, is Jeffrey Sinclair's son with Delenn, then that would start bringing the Valen, Minbari souls back into the Minbari people maybe if if david is minbari or is he more human i mean it's it, it get it, let me just put it this way it opens up a whole new can of worms with regard to the minbari souls and human souls and that whole reincarnation thing but i would have to really sit down and work my way through it to try to even begin to figure out where jms would have gone with it okay because when you start bringing time travel into it and the souls are going from here to there and all that it gets very confusing. So maybe you guys can comment or reply back to me and kind of give me a suggestion where you think that would have, how, how you think that would have all flowed together. Cause it's very complex. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, so there is, that is one, I think that is one interesting, I, one interesting th consequence of them getting together though, is that it would have meant that Valen himself was bringing 
Mimbari souls and human souls together through Delenn back into the gene pool, which would have been interesting. Uh, and then going back in time, and who's to say that Valen doesn't, you know, get with somebody else back then and um, have children? In fact, you know, let me... Let's take the needle off the record for a second. Instead of... I hadn't thought this one through. Instead of Sinclair getting together with Delenn, it might have been that they don't ever get together. They're just work, you know, work acquaintances. And then Sinclair goes back in time as Valen, and he has children back in the past as Valen, and 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 that line of that line of Minbari descended from Valen, who have a genetic predistribution predisposition to being able to turn into humans eventually gives us Delenn. In other words, Delenn could be the great, 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 great granddaughter of Sinclair as Valen. Oh, how about that one? I feel like I've talked about that idea before somewhere, and that may be floating around already. But it is an interesting idea that maybe Delenn was never supposed to marry the human commander of the station. She was just supposed to be the descendant of the human commander of the station who becomes a Minbari. And that when you took Sinclair out of it, then Sheridan comes in and he can actually marry her. So, man, what an interesting complex web uh, JMS did weave with so many different directions it could have gone, huh? Uh, let's see, a few other things about Sinclair you got to think that, I mean, I've always thought that when I watched War Without End, okay, the two-parter War Without End, which is in season uh, three, okay, the great season three, um, War Without End, of course, ends, there's the big spoiler, with Sinclair revealed to be Valen. He's turning into a Minbari. He's revealed to be Valen. He's got the Vorlons there working with him. Uh, and they're back a thousand years or whatever in time. And you got to think that, that would have been sleeping in light, right? I mean, you've got to think that if Sinclair had stayed on the show for all five seasons, then the end of season five would have been War Without End, the, pretty much the same events modified by no Sheridan being there. And then you ended up with uh, Sinclair. You know, in fact, it may have been that Sinclair um, is wounded in the battle, in the, in, in the Shadow War, is somehow given 20 more years of life, and when he knows his time is ending, then he goes back in time to be Valen. Or, um, you know, or something happens in the present time that lets him know it's time to go back. Um, maybe he wouldn't have been wounded. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten 20 more years of life. Maybe that was all added for Sheridan. We'll, we'll never really know, probably. Uh, to continue on that line, uh, let's see. Instead of going beyond the rim, he just goes back a thousand years. So he becomes a loop, right? Instead of going off into the west like the like Frodo and Gandalf and the elves and Lord of the Rings beyond the rim, instead he just goes back in time. So maybe that's maybe that's what it is. Um, and you just had war without end. And again, if Delenn is marrying. Sinclair, then you get the bittersweet Delenn parts instead of, you know, at, sort of tacked onto War Without End. Um, let's see, what else have I not mentioned? Um, one other thing about Sinclair, and then we'll change to some of the other characters for a little, just for a little bit. Um, speaking of Sheridan being injured during the Battle with the Shadows, and it's Lorien who gives him 20 years of life. I always thought it was strange that... Um, I always thought it was strange that... Um, they, they introduced the alien healing machine. And it's used, of course, to save Ivanova. Uh, but I have to wonder, was it originally introduced with the intention of using it to save Sinclair? Because it seemed kind of strange that you introduce and make such a big deal out of this alien healing device, and then you let some other thing heal the main character when he's injured and needs healing. Now, I know they use it to heal Garibaldi. They use it to heal Ivanova. 
poor Marcus, right? Um, it would have been interesting to to, to complete the tr the triumvirate and have Sinclair ultimately healed by it too. Um, and maybe he's even healed by Delin, which is how he gets Minbari energy or something. I don't know. That's just an interesting thought, I think. Um, but they did set it up a lot, and then you said you bring in this character of Lorian to do it. So, who knows? Um, of course, speaking of Ivanova, we all know that if she hadn't left the show after season four, Ivanova was going to be the one who fell in love with Byron. I call this addition by subtraction. Better for Ivanova to just not be on the show than to be, you know, because we know she had some small telepathic power, and I guess Byron would have helped her expand it and develop it, and they would have fallen in love and all that. I'm sort of glad it was Lita and not Susan because, and it's partly the actor. I mean, Robin Atkin Downs is a fine actor and did well enough as Lita's boyfriend, but Susan Ivanova established herself as a no-nonsense butt-kicker. And you just can't see the character portrayed by Robin Atkin Downs as, like, seducing Susan Ivanova. I mean, I know she would be vulnerable after what happened with Marcus, and it would have been a, she would have been, it would have been a time in her life when that could have happened, but still... I just um, I have a hard time seeing them together and, and seeing that making much story sense. So I'm kind of glad it worked out the way it did. We don't see Susan again, of course, until Sleeping in Light. Um, so that and, and another thing, but if Ivanova had stayed on the show, then you might well have had Ivanova be the commander after Sheridan instead of Lockley, and you might have had Ivanova on Crusade instead of Lockley. So. Um, it would have been interesting to see a lot more Ivanova, even though the price we would have paid for more Ivanova would have been Byron and Ivanova. Mm, okay. Uh, let's see. One more uh, related to that, of course, Ivanova was coming to be very close with Talia Winters. And I really liked Talia. I mean, I liked Lita. Lita was great. Lita Alexander as the telepath. But I love Talia Winters. I love Talia Winters. And, of course, we know that she ended up being Control, which is the uh, the evil agent of Psychor, like a separate personality put into her to, 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 to go off and do that. And I think it would have been interesting if, uh, if she had stayed on the show and, of course, if things hadn't changed since the pilot, then I think it was going to be Laurel Takashima who was Control. And it would have been Laurel Takashima who shot Garibaldi in the back. And so in season two, you would have gotten an interesting bit where uh, Garibaldi is trying to remember and figure out who it was that shot him in the back. And he figures out finally that it's Takashima. And she is revealed and captured and sent back, you know, to Psychor in a straight jacket instead of poor Talia. And, and, and here's another thread for Talia. Uh, at one point, there was a, a Lawrence Dottilio episode, uh, rather than a JMS episode, where uh, Kosh is having Talia scanned by this guy who's called the Vicar. And, of course, it turns out that the Vicar is actually some kind of a mechanical man, and what he's doing is he's recording her personality onto a crystal and giving it to Kosh. What that means is that Talia's original personality was possessed by Kosh, or at least a copy of it. The thinking was that it, once Talia is revealed as control in that timeline, Kosh could have somehow restored Talia's personality back. And interestingly, that means that she, Talia, would have been touched by the Vorlons, and so Talia then would be able to be the, the character that Lita becomes in later seasons because she now would have that connection to the Vorlons rather than Lita, or in addition to Lita, and we never would have gotten Lita back. Again, I love Lita. I'm glad she came back. I thought she was great all the way through it, um, but it would have been interesting to see Talia in that role instead of Lita, just as an alternate, right? Um, and, and, of course, she had another power that we, we hadn't gotten to see yet, which is, if you recall, all the way back in Season 1, Episode 6, Mind War, uh, Jason Ironheart, before he became, <laughs> you know, some sort of, sort of 
pre-human Vorlon mind being, right? Um, before he did, he or as he was becoming, uh, Jason Ironheart gave Talia a gift. And it turned out that that gift was telekinesis. She was able to move that penny. So you'd have had a Talia Winter with a connection to the Vorlons, a restored personality, and telekinesis. Hmm. See what we lost by having her leave the show after season two. And I always, I regretted that because it would have been so interesting to see her in season three and four and, and kind of where she, where she went from there. Um... Some characters weren't really affected by the changes. Garibaldi more or less wasn't affected. Dr. Franklin more or less. And of course, Londo and Jakar more or less were not really affected. Delenn, maybe, maybe not. I think her, ch her change would have been if she had married Sinclair or had gone in some other way involving Sinclair. That would have been her major change. But it wouldn't have changed, I don't think, her, her story arc that much. Um... Let me see. Um, one change with Garibaldi, though, that I did think of. I, I just made a few notes here right before I went on the air. So one change with Garibaldi that I think would have been very interesting is um, when, when Garibaldi goes under the mental command of Bester and betrays Sheridan, okay, at, which in this timeline would have happened at the end of Season 3 and carried well over into Season 4, okay, uh, when when Garibaldi went under the control of no, I'm sorry, it happened. It would have happened at the end of season four and carried over to season five. More about that in a second. Okay, yeah, I was off by a season. Um, Garibaldi did not have a history with Sheridan. I mean, they had sort of come to a working understanding with each other and kind of liked each other. And I mean, it it was kind of summarized by Sheridan saying to Garibaldi. I think we're going to get along just fine or something like that at the beginning of season two. That always seemed a little too pat to me, right? Because we knew, we had an established history that Sinclair and Garibaldi went way back. They had shared some strange experiences together. The, the, the DC comics cover a little bit of that. The TV show covered a little bit of that, right? Finding the shadow ship on Mars. Which is a way that the commander of Babylon 5 would have seen a shadow ship before. That would have been helpful. Okay, so because we didn't have that pre-existing condition, that connection between uh, Garibaldi and Sheridan, when, when Garibaldi says, oh, Sheridan's got a god complex, he's out of control, and then he betrays him, thinking he's doing the right thing, when Garibaldi did that to Sheridan, part of me was saying, this could be legit. Garibaldi could legitimately feel that way about John Sheridan. I had, I had no real problem accepting that. But if it's Sinclair, there's no way that a Sinclair coming back from Zaha Doom even then and rallying the people as the... There's, a, there's an Easter egg for you card game folks. There's no way that, a, that, that Garibaldi would have convincingly betrayed Sinclair and, and for us to have bought that it was legit. Right? There's no way. We'd have known if, if, if Garibaldi betrays Sinclair like that, something is up. He's being manipulated. It's probably, oh, Bester, right? So it was a, I think it would have been harder to swallow that than it was to swallow Garibaldi um, just thinking Sheridan was out of control. So I don't know. Some of you probably think that you didn't, you know, you didn't buy it either. You thought, oh, well, I, you know, Garibaldi would never do that to Sheridan. But it felt manufactured. I just didn't buy that Garibaldi and Sheridan had built up that much of a connection that quickly. Okay, so that would have been different. Uh, let's see. That would have led to a different sort of intersections in real time episode, which would have been the end of season four, right? So the way that everything changes, and you guys probably know this, season four would have only been the Shadow War. Uh, Into the Fire would have happened maybe, what, two-thirds of the way through season four rather than a third of the way through or, or whatever it was. Um, a little before that. Um, and maybe it didn't need to get dragged out much further, but it would have been a little further along. And then the second half of season four would have ended with, with, uh, with Sheridan, um, 
being captured by the Earth, by, by Clark, President Clark, and being interrogated. So intersections in real time would have been the cliffhanger for season four. So, of course, season five would have been the Earth War and then uh, War Without End being the Sleeping in Light substitute. Uh, I don't know if we would have gotten anything with the Drock or the Centauri. I guess maybe, but that seems awfully added on to give season five something to do. Now, you may say, well, but it needed to set up Londo being with the Keeper. I think they could have set that up a different way that didn't involve John Sheridan and Delenn's child. Okay, so there's a lot going on there that just would have had to be completely reshuffled, and in fact, it may have not ever been completely nailed down exactly by JMS. Again, we'll, we'll never know. He's probably never going to say, and we'll never know. Um, the other thing we would have never gotten is we would have never gotten Deconstruction of Falling Stars. The only reason we have Deconstruction of Falling Stars is that JMS thought the show was going to end at the end of Season 4. That was the, the, the understanding he had. At, during season, as he's writing Season 4, he is basically told by, by the production company, the uh, P10, this is the last season we're doing, so you better wrap everything up now. So he crammed the last of, all, of, of that whole story into Season 4, and uh, then at the last minute, they get the reprieve that they'll get a fifth season from TNT. Right, yeah. And so the finale for season four, which is Sleeping in Light, that would have fall uh, that would have followed Rising Star. Okay, you would have gotten Rising Star, where Sheridan becomes president of the galaxy, and then you would have gotten Sleeping in Light, twenty years later. So JMS moves Sleeping in Light all the way to the end of season five, which is cool because we get Ivanova back and everything. And he needed a new finale for season four. And so Deconstruction of Falling Stars was the replacement finale for season four that was filmed as technically the first episode of season five. That's what's weird is that if you, if you go by the production order, the last episode of season four, Deconstruction of Falling Stars, is really 501. 501. And... Sleeping in Light, the last episode of season five, is really 422. That was weird. 422. So, all right. Uh, last thing, Jeffrey Sinclair would, would be president of the Interstellar Alliance right up until he took Babylon 4 back in time to win the first Shadow War. After he wins the second Shadow War, which, mean the sh which would mean that the Shadows just cannot beat... Jeffrey Sinclair. So maybe instead of now get the hell out of our galaxy, instead the shadows are like, let me do my little shadow guy. We cannot beat you, Jeff. We will go off beyond the rim instead. <laughs> so maybe that's what would have happened. Who knows? But uh, you would have gotten Jeffrey Sinclair as president of the Interstellar Alliance. Huh. So um, if you want to see my interview with Bruce Boxleitner and Mira Furlan, I didn't really get to go into all this kind of story stuff because they're actors and they, I mean, they know more about it than a lot of actors of TV shows. You know, Boxleitner's pretty up on, pretty up on the mythology of the show. It's pretty amazing. Uh, in fact, in one convention, he famously said, ah, I just said, kill them all. Let Valen sort them out, <laughs> which is brilliant. And I just love that Bruce Boxleitner said that. Uh, as an actor, not as not in character. Um, so, um, if you want to see that, go on YouTube and you can find a video interview where I interviewed the two of them at Dragon Con. I think 2013, maybe 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. It's pretty fun. About an hour long interview in front of a very big audience. It was very intimidating, but it was very fun, very rewarding. One of the high points of my life, certainly as a Babylon Five fan, to get to sit down with the two of them. And talk about uh, their time on Babylon 5. So, Okay, I'm sure there's a whole lot more I could talk about. Uh, I'd have to sit down and think of it, though. That's about as far as I got. Um, so do comment on the Patreon page or on Twitter at Van Allen Plexico or on Facebook, Van Allen Plexico. And let me know what you thought about my deductions and guesses and how you see it differently or where you see it might going. And don't forget to listen to our show uh, on the White Rocket Show as Jared Albrick and I continue our journey. It's really neat to get to, to go alongside somebody who's never watched it before 
and get his reaction to it episode by episode. So uh, I guess we'll wrap up for now, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this at all it's in some way. And uh, I guess the next few shows won't be Babylon 5. I've kind of uh, drained this topic dry. I'll come up with some new topics that you'll find interesting. And anyway, we'll see you guys later. Take it easy. Where's the button? The override. Where's the override?